Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Becky Belcour. I work with an organization called NACASAC. We're a national Asian American organization whose mission is to organize Asian Americans towards social, racial, and economic justice. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for this panel. We're really excited to share uh, some of our work and what we're looking forward to with you all. Uh, NACASAC is a member of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans called NCAPA. And CAPA is a coalition of 36 national Asian Pacific American organizations from across the country and provides a national voice for our issues. And on beha behalf of NCAPA, we welcome you to the NCAPA Policy Platform Briefing Series with a panel tonight focusing on Asian American and Pacific Islander immigration challenges. As many of us know, our immigration system is extremely broken. Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are the fastest growing immigrant population in the United States and immigration issues deeply impact our community as we are immigrants ourselves or have parents, grandparents and family members who are immigrants. Over 73% of adult Asian Americans are immigrants and of the over 11 million undocumented immigrants living in this country, 2 million are Asian American. Our voice and our leadership is critical for a strong immigrant justice movement. And on this panel, we'll talk more about some of the specific issues impacting our community and some of the solutions we are proposing via the NCAPA policy platform moving forward. So I'm very excited we're being joined by four amazing panelists this evening. Uh, the first one is Sungwon, who is an immigrant justice fellow with NACASAC. She is a community organizer and she graduated from the William Patterson University with a double major in global business and economics. We will also hear from Fahima, who is the executive direct director of the National Tongan American Society. Her leadership and skills have helped to develop programs and provide access to thousands of Pacific Islanders in Utah to healthier lifestyles increased civic engagement, voter registration, citizenship, access to higher education, social justice efforts, and cultural preservation. We are also joined by Megan Esaheb, who is the Director of Immigration Advocacy at Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. She advocates in Congress and federal agencies on issues affecting immigrants, including immigration reform, guest worker programs, family reunification, and other critical issues for our community. And finally, we will also hear from Kam Mua, the Director of Immigration Policy with the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center, uh, CRAC. Uh, Kam is also the co-chair of NCAPA's Immigration Committee, and he spearheads CRAC's immigration policy portfolio through policy analysis, community engagement, and legislative and regulatory advocacy. So uh, we have a really, really informed um, panelists with us tonight, and we're excited to hear from them. So first, we'll start with Sungwan. So I'll pass uh, the mic to Sungwan. Hello. I don't know if everybody can see me okay. This is Sungwan. I'm an organizer with NACASEC. I am undocumented without DACA. Even though I am not a DACA holder, I was thrilled to hear that the news about DACA decision last week. Um, after hearing about that, I had more hope for my friends, my family, and of course for myself as well. And being undocumented with no DACA during this time, during this pandemic is definitely not easy. I actually never felt really fearful as growing up undocumented this badly until this pandemic. But because I know that I don't qualify for any of the government funds or have health insurance, um, not not having health insurance is definitely one big part that I was more afraid of and my family as well. Um, catching this virus means a lot of money and a lot of pain, as you all know. <laughs> like thinking that, can I afford this? Can my family afford the cost of all this? Um, I think I was thinking around that a lot more than just being undocumented at that moment. Um, I was even afraid to see my family members go out to get groceries. I never thought I would be so scared to see my parents putting on masks and gloves to go get groceries. Because my whole family was not comfortable with anyone living home, I did not step outside of my house for six weeks straight during April and in May. Literally six weeks at home stuck, not even fresh air. <laughs> um, aside from all that about health related, Anti-racism also skyrocketed during this time. A couple of weeks ago, my, my mom and I went outside for a walk and 
I'm still in shock because I grew up in my town for 14 years and never had never had to face this until now. And somebody literally yelled at me and my mom to fuck off and go back. And I know my mom did not understand, but you, you can definitely feel it in the moment. And we just kind of stood there because we're so shocked. Um, and this is why I think my parents don't want me to leave or step outside of my house thinking that what can happen to my children? Also being undocumented, I think they were very afraid. I feel like the anxiety has been building up since pandemic within me and my family members. And I have a big family. I have uh, five members living in this house right now. And no one was working until yesterday when my mom started to go back to work. So past couple of months, it was nice to see my family just, you know, staying home together and not working except me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I just hope that things will get better and that my family and I don't have to worry too much about it. Um, like I said earlier, I am undocumented and I'm one of more than 2 million undocumented Asian Americans living in the United States right now. And I came to the United States when I was 10 years old with my family without knowing that this country would be my new home. I didn't even know I was undocumented until I was 14 years old or 18. <laughs> it's not that important, I guess, being undocumented. It's just a paperwork that you have and I don't have. This is how random our immigration, immigration system is and it is so broken, it hurts me very deeply. I grew up believing that the United States was a land of freedom with a set of fixed ideals. That, the, that we were a democracy that believed in the equal, equality of all people, no matter who we are. But a government that protects only those who are young and deemed to be deserving, and the Trump administration that has threatened to take away these critical protections for even some of our community members that we fought so hard for, it just doesn't make sense to me. It has to be fixed now for all of us. Our people need citizenship for all. Citizenship for all 11.4 million undocumented immigrants and 35,000 intercountry adoptees without citizenship in the United States. Citizenship for all, regardless of, regardless of criminal backgrounds, citizenship for all, which means more than just paperwork. Full citizenship, that means we're all we all have access to basic human rights, including quality food, education, housing, healthcare, and clean water and air. Citizenship for all with justice, so that black person, no black person is ever murdered by the police again. Citizenship for all without ICE, no detention centers, no prisons. And citizenship for all with the freedom to move and to stay. I believe that we can do this and we must do all that we can to protect our people and fight for our rights and justice. We must work together for citizenship for all, abolish ICE, and defund the police. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sungwan, for sharing your experience with us and really rooting us in why this work is so important and also for your powerful call for citizenship for all and the solutions that we are all working towards together. So thank you so much. Uh, next, we'll have Fahina, who will talk a little bit about the experiences of the Pacific Islander community and immigration. And then, okay, thank you. Um, like she said, my name is Fahina. I'm with the National Tongan American Society here in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, as, our, as far as our immigration work, what our main work and the things that our community needs most as far as immigration is gaining citizenship. Uh, like Kim said, that's a big um, issue for them. So, um, in fact, our organization, the National Tongan American Society, started because of that great need in our community. Many people wanted to apply for citizenship, but couldn't um, couldn't quite figure out the system. 
and didn't know quite how to do it. So we started out uh, in 1994 um, helping people without, you know, without any pay, without any funding, without anything. We just helped for free. And it wasn't until 1996 that we got our first funding uh, and we became a 501c3. But, but it was basically because of civic engagement work, helping people to get citizenship here in Utah. And of course, um, that's one of our priorities is to help our people to get their citizenship, citizen, citizenship <laughs> so that we can, uh, so that would, they would be able to uh, participate fully in being American citizens like voting and whatever other uh, possible, you know, benefits that they might have. Like for an example, we also help um, a lot of green card people that has been here forever. A lot of them grew up here and have green card and have paid towards uh, the taxes and everything that any typical American would do, but yet the benefits that they get are hardly any. Uh, so they pay the taxes, they get one side of things and they don't get the other side. Uh, so those are some of the things that are, are kind of urgent to many of our people and that's what we help with uh, doing that. And of course, a lot of our people also want uh, to get their green card be and, or citizenship um, green card first so that they can travel back travel back and forth without getting stuck, you know, uh, somewhere, uh, returning or things of that type. Um, in part of our work, we also, um, some of the challenges is that uh, language, language is a challenge. And so we provide ESL languages where we help people prep for their, for their citizenship test. So we do it in Tongan and English and trying to, to help them to do that because a lot of our people, um, especially our older citizens, um, some of our older folks, of course, they have that benefit that if you're 55 years and older and have 20 years, you, you know, you can have a translator, but then of course you have to be older and stuff. But we have people that come from the island and they only speak Tongan and they're not quite old yet. So, um, so we, we help that, we provide that ESL um, for them. And for those who do qualify for translator, we also help, we go in with them and interpret for them um, when needed in the, um, when they go in and test for their citizenship um, or, or with their interview. Also, um, one of the things that we do in our, in, in our organization here is oftentimes our people are, are trans, you know, they're not, you know, they haven't purchased a home, so they don't have a home that they can stay in for like super long time. Like many of them will have a, you know, will rent and, and they will be, they move all over the place. And so, with their authorization, we become, uh, we receive their mail from the USCIS, from the immigration people. We receive their mail and once we get it, then we contact them and then they come in. And of course then we, or either that or we contact that we need you to bring this form and what have you. Um, so that's kind of like another part that we do to help them. Um, also many of our, uh, uh, our clients have issues, uh, like Kim said earlier, with the background checks uh, some of them don't qualify because they, you know, they've had a couple of criminal type stuff, but that was like 20, 10, 15, 20 years ago and they've changed, but yet it still becomes an issue. So, so that's an issue there. And I think they've also, they're looking to change, um, you know, some of the waiver. Uh, I mean, they, before you could qualify for a waiver, if you um, have SNAP or food stamps or things of that type, you can qualify, but now they, uh, you know, they're making that so that now it's more difficult to, especially for our community, because we have a lot of people that are laborers, or they work in warehouses or things of that, you know, things of that, they don't make a whole lot of money. So we're working with a, with a community that's also poor. And so that paying $725 for citizenship or 625 or whatever for a green card, it becomes a challenge for them. So that's a big barrier is um, not only language, but also finances is a big barrier for our community is a big challenge. Um, one of the, um, the other thing that we're also looking at is um, that we're having difficulty is the time frame where this, uh, when we mail things in or when we work with USCIS, uh, it takes them, there's a long wait, waiting time period for, to process the paper. It's like from eight months to 18 months. And if you're on a waiver, yeah, it takes about 18, you know, over a year to wait for your paper to, to go. So that's, uh, the timing is also uh, is a challenge for many of our people. 
um, that, that are applying. Um, also, a lot of times, um, sometimes when they're reapplying, which is something that they could help if they had copies, but sometimes when they lose their cards, their green cards or things like that, or if it's expired, the, the process time to get a new one takes forever. And sometimes several, well, actually many of our people, well, when they've lost that, they, um, they lose their job because they can't, uh, uh, you know, get their, um, you know, card to show that they actually are legally here. So the processing time for USCIS for several things is, is, um, is difficult, is, is a challenge for many. Um, and I think for, for us, um, when I look at things, it's trust is also an issue. And we receive a lot of our work from pe from our community. And also we have some Hispanic people that also come to us where we help them to it. But it's not only Tongans, it's Samoans and other uh, Pacific Islanders. And like I said, some Hispanic and a few refugees uh, and some things where we have helped them. Uh, but because it's uh, we've been out there and they trust us, I think that's also a, a benefit that we have gotten, been able to promote in our community. So that's kind of like basically most of the community. Well, and then of course, the other big thing that we do is right upon they get their citizenship and you know they do their raising their hand and do that stuff, we register them to vote and we talk about voting and how important voting is for them. So we also do voter registration and promote that in our community to get on that. And then one of the things that we're also doing now is we're really trying to push that. Um, the census 20, 2020, even amongst those who are illegal, we educate them that this has absolutely nothing to do with, it's not gonna, um, you know, many of our people are, are scared, but these are some parts of the civic engagement that we tell them it's very important that we participate in this so that we can all be counted, so that fundings that are needed and to help in our different com government things are also funded here to Utah. So yeah, so that's kind of like two of the things that we talk about here. Thank you so much, Fahina. Wow, that you all sound very busy. That's a lot of work. And it's really, um, that's a great model that you all are using where you're providing those critical services that your community really needs, while also then empowering them to make the systemic change through things like civic engagement. So thank you so much for sharing both about the issues of the Pacific Islander community and then some of the things that you all are doing to address those. Yeah. So next we will have uh, Megan and Kam, they will share about the NCAPA policy platform on immigration. Hey everyone. Um, thank you, Fahina and Sangwan. I appreciated hearing um, you all speaking and I was thinking about how to not make the presentation of our po particularly wonky policy platform um, too boring. So <laughs> it's just trying to group um, thinking about, you know, ways to look at this. And actually it struck me that the whole concept of citizenship for all, um, if we just did grant citizenship for all and undocumented people, as well as, um, you know, many other people who are stuck in various temporary statuses, we wouldn't have to have many, many of these policy recommendations because what we're doing is fighting for due process in all these different spaces in deportations and detention or getting people out of detention or, you know, in the process of applying for asylum or we're fighting for rights like work authorization or, um, you know, public benefits like health care for people who have less than you know, and, and many of those things are taken care of just by people getting citizenship or, um, you know, and making it a lot easier to access citizenship. So I do think that's um, key. Um, I think another big question after that, if we did that was then we still have to have a conversation as a nation about who we let into the country and how, right? Um, and so that's refugees, family-based immigration, employment-based immigration. So the NCAPA platform, we embrace the system we have, which is predominantly a family-based immigration system. Um, we'd like to see increased uh, refugees and <clears throat> uh, better access for asylum seekers and other humanitarian programs, um, as well as to fix 
key problems in the employment-based system um, where workers don't have rights or are having those same problems of really of accessing um, citizenship and all the rights that that entails. Um, so, you know, I was thinking it's also about citizenship for the other side, um, who I would call the bad guys. <laughs> The Center for Immigration Studies, Numbers USA, Federation for Immigration Reform, they're the, the people that lobby to lower immigration levels, and they're the um, people behind all of the Trump administration's policy ideas. <clears throat> and um, all of the uh, long list of policies changes he's done that really have just been to make it harder for people to um, either come into the country or if they're already here, again, access citizenship. Um, so those policies started with the Muslim ban and the refugee ban. Um, and then later the public charge rule and other um, similar policies like the healthcare proclamation, which is aimed at requiring people to have expensive health insurance before they can get a visa. That one's um, on a temporary, under a temporary court order, so it's not in effect. But the idea, of course, is to another way to only let wealthy immigrants into the country. Um, and then on um, in April, he banned um, immigrant visas, which are green card people from getting green cards um, from outside the country almost entirely. There's an exception for people who are coming to work specifically on the coronavirus pandemic, um, you know, or other related science or um, food chain workers. But he banned that immigrant visas for two months. And on Monday, he extended that ban through the rest of the year um, and also added <clears throat> a ban on certain non-immigrant visas. H-1Bs, L's, lots of J's. Um, there's a lot of different kinds of non-immigrant visas. Um, H-2Bs. So um, again, there's exceptions for people who are gonna work in, I think the food industry, the H-2A agricultural visas are still being given out. But, um, you know, kind of circling back to our platform, I think that you know, one big bucket <laughs> Of our of our work moving forward is to call to really undo everything he's done, but then the other you know area is to um, push for something bolder and transformative and something that will get rid of a lot of the need to have you know these fights around the edges of due process <clears throat> and around the edges of <clears throat> giving people like a little bit of fairness and dignity. Um, <clears throat> We have um, a lot of, on the family immigration, on the, the legal immigration side of things, we have a lot of proposals that we support in the Reuniting Families Act, um, which would build upon our current family-based system and clear the family-based backlogs, um, which are around 4 million. I'll just pause on that for a second. So there's about 4 million people waiting to reunite with family members. That backlog is going to grow due to this proclamation. Um, and um, a, a large portion of folks are from Asian countries. There are particular back, long backlogs um, for people trying to come from the, the Philippines, China, India, Vietnam. I'm always forgetting one. What am I forgetting? China, India, Philippines, Vietnam. No, I guess Mexico is the other one. So I was just naming the Asian countries. Um, and then there, there's a long wait line for people from Mexico. So, um, but the, the Reuniting Families Act, which is Representative Judy Chu's bill, would also provide equality for same sex couples in, in our immigration laws, increase diversity visas, and um, solve some of the problems around the H-1B visas that families face, which is again about accessing citizenship. There are um, hundreds of thousands of people, mostly from India, stuck in H-1B visas. Um, they can't get green cards and they um, face challenges like their children grow up with them in the United States, but when they turn 21, they lose um, that status that they have because of their parent if they haven't gotten a green card yet. 
they're also, the administration's also threatening to take work authorization from the spouses of um, H-1B workers, which is a very much a gender equity issue because most of the spouses are women. Um, so there's a lot in the Reuniting Families Act um, and we have all these recommendations in our, in our platform. Um, so that's, that's a big area. I mentioned refugees. The Trump administration has slashed refugees, um, refugee admissions to now around 30,000, but I don't think that the full 30,000 this year is going to come in. The president sets, um, by law, the president sets that number every year. So we'd like to see a floor, Congress set a floor where they, um, you know, say there has to be at least um, 75,000 refugees resettled and the president can always go higher than that. Um, sorry, I'm a little bit all over, not following my slides, but. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you've I don't read any reporting, um, the Burmese um, community has been, um, a lot of people from Burma have been resettled in recent years. And I think most recently, the Rohingya. Um, so a lot of those folks are waiting to be reunited with refugees abroad who are in refugee camps. There's, they could be reunited either through the refugee program, if it were to function better and have larger numbers, um, or even some of them could sponsor family members through family-based visas. But um, Burmese nationals are blocked both by um, what we call the expanded Muslim ban or African ban that Trump put out in January that cut all um, immigrants from Myanmar or Burma um, and then now again, of course, the whole, all immigration is shut down. Um, so just an issue to highlight. Um, I guess I said a little about H-1B visas. I think that the other issues that actually I believe are in a different part of our um, uh, policy platform uh, around um, non-immigrant visas, some of the lesser skilled workers, H H2B visas, some of the J1 visas uh, where workers come and um, have poor working conditions, poor wages, and are really uh, subject to exploitation and abuse. Um, and that their immigration status plays a strong role in that because they're tied to typically one employer dependent on them. They live, the employer provides them housing, the employer provides them access to healthcare, like literally like they, they don't have a you know way to get to health centers without their employer driving them or a way to get to the grocery store without their employer driving them. So it's just way too much power, employer over people. Um, you know, again, so that, we look at a better way if we're going to bring people in the country to work we should give them you know a path to and the opportunity paths to permanency and opportunity to become citizens um, so and then um I have, we have on here the chinese student ban there's also been another theme of this administration um which is um really calling all people, the president and the FBI have sort of called all people from uh, China spies. Um, and there's a real mandate to go after Chinese nationals include, and Asian Americans um, who have any contacts with China. Um, so we're seeing, we've seen um, a lot of ramp up of FBI activity and um, on the student visa front, um, some just exclusion of Chinese students and now more recently pretty much um, shutting down new visas. So come, can you go back to the last slide? I think I, um, thank you. Yes, I was like, kind of, we talked about um, path to citizenship for undocumented, or I said it briefly, but I just wanna return to that for a minute. Just we put some data in here. There's about 1.7 million undocumented Asians and um, and then the, the documented population, yay, we had good news <laughs> last week with the Supreme Court. Just
So only 16,000 people enrolled in the program, but we know over 100,000 people are eligible for DACA. So if um, it is, the program is supposed to reopen and people can reapply or can apply for the first time. Um, and then <clears throat> another group of um, people with temporary status are people with temporary protected status, which is a humanitarian program. Um, where the government designates people who are victims of natural disasters or <clears throat> other civil war or something uh, when they're in the Uni United States gives them temporary protected status and um, around 15,000 people from Nepal of TPS and this president has been seeking to end TPS for um, all of the different TPS programs and um, <clears throat> is also under court order right now to keep the program going, but we don't know what's going to happen as that litigation proceeds. So, um, you know, we're, we're asking Congress to pro provide relief to both of those populations. Um, and a little bit, I had put some numbers around diversity visas. The diversity visa program is um, really successful. The president and, and other people like to slam it because it is, a lottery, people have to apply and be qualified um, for 50,000 diversity visas, but it was um, put into law to try to give people opportunities from countries where they may not have family who can sponsor them. So it only goes to people from countries with low immigration levels to the United States. And it's really successful because it doesn't have any backlogs. People apply, their number gets picked. There's until the program was shut down by Trump, certainty, <laughs> there was certainty in the program. Um, and it's a big pathway for African immigrants to come to the United States, but um, also there are particular uh, Pacific Islander and Asian countries, you can see Nepal and Fiji are um, top of the list of uh, people who use the, you know, uh, nationalities who use the program. Um, and then, Finally, I've been talking a while. Um, naturalization, denaturalization. The government is raising naturalization fees. Um, I think almost double the fees. It hasn't happened yet, so people can definitely get their applications in under the current $750, which we already think is too high. Um, we'd like to see naturalization rates lowered, more fee waivers, um, and I think uh, for some. Uh, better English language waivers for, for um, some folks in the community. And then another tactic of this administration has been to denaturalize people, um, which um, they've been spending a lot of money to have these denaturalization task forces, which has dual goals of actually denaturalizing some people, but also scaring people. And it also has, um, you know, the effect of saying that naturalized citizens are not equal to citizens born here, right? I mean, naturalization, uh, citizenship is supposed to be unassailable, but when they go, and when they're, you know, attempting to naturalize people, it um, attacks that very concept. Um, so not a lot of these cases, I don't think have gone, it, through the courts fully yet, um, so we'll see. I mean, I think that I'm hoping some judges will um, not like what the government is doing on naturalization, but we'll see. With that, I'll hand it over to Com to talk about the other half of the platform. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. The other pieces of the INCAPA platform focus primarily on enforcement. So this is really looking at decriminalizing the migration, system, migration into the United States and restoring due process back to the immigration process. Uh, as many of us know, the United States immigration system is built and rooted in racism and the exclusion of non-white immigrants into the US. And part of the reason why, you know, I say that is that sections 275 and 276 of the um, Immigrant and Nationality Act was created in the 20s specifically to exclude um, migrants from Central America and from Mexico um, and are still part of our um, laws today. They are part of the major reason why we see family separations at the border. And this is because when you, 
first, um, you know, cross into the United States uh, from the southern border, you're, it's considered a misdemeanor. And then the second reentry is considered a felony. And when an asylum seeker is coming to the U.S. with their child, they're first booked by Customs and Border Patrol and then immediately handed over to the U.S. Marshals, which creates that separation of the parent and the child. Um, and the other piece that, uh, you know, this really leads to is that uh, our enforcement system now is also built on the 1996 immigration laws. So in 1996, the United States passed, uh, Congress passed the Illegal Immigrant um, Responsibility and, um, and uh, the Illegal Immigrant Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act. They also passed the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act. And together, what these laws did was, uh, one, uh, require mandatory detention for individuals, for select immigrants. Two, automate uh, the deportation process. Three, uh, massively expand crimes that are considered deportable. Uh, four, restricted the judicial discretion of immigration judges. And then five, were applied retroactively. So that means that someone who was not deportable in 1995 woke up one day and suddenly became deportable. Um, and, you know, this is part of the major reason why our immigration system consider, continues to lack any due process for folks who are going through it, because at every step of the way, the United States is... Uh, uh, have, has sort of stranglehold the ability of individuals to provide relief for folks going through this system. Essentially, if you have a conviction and you go into the process, you will very likely be deported. Uh, you know, we've uh, at the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center, many of our partners have worked with uh, clients who were, you know, arrested when they were 16, tried as an adult, spent 10 years in prison, and then were immediately transferred to Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, for an additional uh, like six to 12 months, and then were immediately deported. Between the moment of their arrest and when they were deported, they never were able to step foot onto uh, outside of a concrete wall. Um, and, you know, uh, for INCAPA, a lot of our solutions are really around trying to unravel the uh, 1996 immigration laws so that we can, one, just restore proce uh, due process back to it, provide immigration judges with uh, judicial discretion, and to eliminate uh, things like mandatory detention, automatic deportations, re uh, uh, redefine um, convictions. Um, so that's sort of, you know, uh, that's part of our immigration enforcement platform. Um, the other piece I want to, you know, also touch on is just border militarization. Um, for INCAPA, it remains an issue. Um, oftentimes when we, thought, when we think of um, asylum seekers who are uh, crossing the southern border, we often think of, you know, Central American migrants, but South Asians, there's been a large number of South Asian individuals who've also crossed through the southern border and have been apprehended by um, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, uh, according to our partners at the South, uh, at South Asian Americans leading together, about 17,000 um, South Asian individuals have been detained and arrested by uh, Customs, and For uh, Customs and Border Protection um, between 2014 and 2019. Um, and we also know that Customs and Border Patrol, like much of the uh, immigration enforcement agents, uh, other immigration enforcement agencies, have, uh, a, have blatantly disregarded congressional action, lack proper oversight, um, and uh, really are not being held um, adequately accountable to the U.S. public. Um, we've seen numerous deaths in CBP custody. Uh, we've seen the civil and human rights of detained individuals being viola violated. Um, for example, the forced uh, feeding of, you know, South Asian men who were uh, conducting hun hunger strikes. Um, and really, you know, the most recent disregard that the CBP has, you know, shown is one, uh, you know, unnecessarily uh, buying 
uh, you know, ATVs and other items for the agency that were unauthorized by Congress, um, not providing basic hygiene to detained individuals, despite the fact that there's a pandemic going on and individuals who are in custody, you know, are some of the most at risk individuals. Uh, so, you know, part of our platform is really also about providing more oversight to uh, Customs and Border Patrol and to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, just going back to the 1996 immigration laws, you know, Southeast Asian Americans uh, have seen about 17,000 individuals given a final order of removal since 1998 because of the 96 immigration laws. And although this administration has vehemently attacked immigrant communities and have gone after uh, our community at, at, at a pretty unprecedented rate. Um, we know that every administration since the Clinton administration has aggressive, have pretty aggressively also gone after our communities uh, for uh, convictions, um, despite that you know, the majority of these individuals have already served their time. And as Americans, we often think of our prison system as a system to um, help folks reform their lives, but don't give these individuals that process. Um, so, it, uh, you know, in this PowerPoint, um, I have really quick data on Southeast Asian deportations, um, you know, removal orders to date. Um, for Southeast Asian Americans, you know, 80% of the removal orders are because of prior uh, convictions, which can range from something as small as having a couple, you know, pills of ecstasy and being uh, convicted of drug trafficking to something as, uh, you know, as big as having like two DUIs. <laughs> It's pretty ludicrous what this administration and really all administrations have gone after immigrants for to deport them. And although this issue is particularly um, heightened in the Southeast Asian American community, deportation, detention and deportations affect Asian Americans across all spectrum. Um, I have a short little video that I want to just show a few minutes of. Uh, it you know, is an interview with um, some of our partners at Mekong NYC talking about the work and sort of what they've uh, seen and what they've done within the Southeast Asian community. Um, so I'll play for me just about three minutes uh, and then I'll quickly get to solutions. Thank you. Audio is not working, Kong. Oh, well, uh, you know, I, I can just uh, link the video later. Um, but our communities have been trying to fight deportations of Southeast Asian Americans for uh, over two decades now. We know that, you know, the vast majority of the individuals who are deported are men, but this has a huge impact on women and children in the United States. For example, one of our partners in Minnesota, uh, when her husband was detained, her family spent $50,000 to try to release him from detention, lost their health insurance during that period, uh, despite the fact that they had increased medical costs for, uh, for mental health uh, care for both her and her children, uh, along with their legal fees. Um, uh, so for NCAPA, you know, our solutions are, are relatively simple, right? One, we need to eliminate sections 275 and 276 of the Immigrant and Nationality Act so that we decriminalize migration. It does not make it so that someone can still freely uh, cross the U.S. border since it's still a there's it's still a civil penalty, but it no longer makes it a crime. <clears throat> Two, in order to demilitarize our borders, you know, uh, the uh, NCAPA believes strongly in listening and working with 
the border communities, uh, reallocating CBP funding and limiting the authority of the Department of Homeland Security to transfer funds between different agencies. We've already seen them do that uh, when they transferred you know, a large sum of money from FEMA to immigration enforcement. And one of the consistent asks is to want, is to limit the ability of the Department of Homeland Security to reprogram and transfer funding uh, from, you know, agencies like FEMA to Immigration and Customs Enforcement or to Customs and Border Protection. Um, the other, uh, you know, uh, set of solutions that we're looking at and that can be found in the platform is um, really restoring uh, due process back to the immigration system. So that means, you know, uh, changing the, the, con the convictions that make someone deportable. Um, prior to the passage of the 96 immigration laws, um, there was a much lower, th uh, there was a much higher threshold for what crimes would be uh, considered uh, deportable. But the 1996 uh, laws, um, you know, drastically reduced them. So a lot of this is about really just bringing it back to, um, you know, a, uh, to a process that uh, gives a lot of immigrants a fighting chance um, through this. Um, some of the other solutions that you can find in the platform, including uh, include creating a statute of limitations for, um, you know, uh, removability. Um, I think immigrant in the immigration system, it's one of the uh, it. There are no statute of limitations, right? You can you know commit a uh, you can be convicted 50 years ago and be deported for it today, um, whereas in the in the criminal system it there's at least there you can time out of it um and then you know the uh our solutions also include um eliminating section 287g so section 287g is secure communities it allows federal law enforcement uh, federal immigration enforcement to conscript local law enforcement to act as immigration agents and we've already seen you know how terrible local law enforcement can be over the last three weeks or so, uh, and how strained our local law enforcement is as well. And there really is no need to uh, um, have our uh, local police also operate as law enforcement, uh, uh, immigration enforcement agents. Um, the last two pieces that I wanna highlight specifically for restoring, restoring due process is restoring uh, judicial discretion back to immigration judges, and then creating a right to come home for immigrants who've been deported. Specifically, if they're, if the basis for their deportation has been vacated or has been found to be, you know, um, uh, unlawful. We've seen a number of cases over the last couple of years where individuals have been deported, have been living in like Cambodia for like four years, but were found to have never had uh, to, were found that they never should have been removed from the U.S. in the first place, either because they were already U.S. citizens or because the base, the, their case had been vacated. Um, for detention, um, it, you know, for us, it, it also goes back to just, uh, you know, fixing the 1996 uh, laws. Um, so this also means in increasing oversight of uh, CBP and ICE detention facilities. It means, um, you know, requiring that uh, the Department of Homeland Security release vulnerable communities into alternatives to detention. Um, it means passing the Dignity for Detained Immigrants Act. Um, and it also, uh, you know, uh, means just eliminating mandatory detention from the statutes. Um, and then uh, I think the last thing I want to flag for folks is just that, you know, a lot of our enforcement priorities are also encompassed in a bill called the New Way Forward Act that was introduced late last year by Representative Jesus Chui Garcia, uh, Pramila Jayapal, Karen Bass, and Ayanna Presley. Um, and the bill, you know, encompasses a lot of uh, broad enforcement provisions that are forward looking and do not um, stop at just reversing what this administration has done because we know that enforcement um, uh, and you know stripping immigrants of due process protections goes all the way back to 1996 and even further um, so the solutions that we have shouldn't just be about you know reversing short-term changes but really 
rethinking the entire immigration enforcement system and sort of really overhauling it so that it's equitable and fair. Hey, thank you both so much. So as everyone could hear, the NCAPA Subcommittee on Immigration really put together a very comprehensive platform uh, to move forward. And Common and Megan, really thank you both for your leadership in, facilita in facilitating our membership and being able to put this kind of platform together. So now we will go into questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and we will try to address them. Uh, but the first question that we have is, how can we reverse the public charge rule? If one of you all would like to address that. So there's two ways. There's um, the public charge rule is um, a regulation, which just means it's up to um, administrative agencies, the president essentially, to, he made the rule, he changed the rule. So any subsequent president can undo it. Um, and also, of course, Congress can override anything the president does. So um, Representative Judy Chu has a bill to end the, the public charge rule. I believe there are other bills. Um, you know, so folks can ask them, check and see if their members of Congress are, are on that bill. They have their name um, co-sponsoring that bill and ask them to do it. Um, I don't know if there's a bill in the Senate, but you can just always, we encourage you to ask both your senators and your member of Congress anytime you want them to do anything. You don't need to know the name of the bill. Just say, hey, I want you to do something to stop this public charge rule. Com, anything to add? <laughs> or Becky? No, I mean, most... For a lot of the executive orders, we, you know, the president, we need a, a president who will rescind the orders. Okay, thank you. Another question is, so there, there has been a very, just within the last day or so, another executive order that uh, the Trump administration released that impacts immigrant visas. So first, how does that executive order impact the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in specific? And second, can you clarify how it impacts someone who's on OPT and is going and has been applying for H-1B visa? So it only impacts people outside the country. Um, well, people on, on the immigrant visa front, people outside the country have been subject to it since the first proclamation in April. 23rd, which has now been extended. So um, it doesn't impact people applying for green cards within the country called adjustment of status, which is if they're allowed to, if people are allowed to um, apply for a green card inside the country. And um, there, that, there are some other barriers because right now, now USCIS has not been doing interviews or fingerprinting. That should open back up. Um, but technically, people can apply for green cards in the, inside the country. So that impacts, as, we, as I mentioned, many um, Asian Americans, Asian immigrants come through family-based immigration. Um, and those particular countries have long waiting lines. And so I think they're not going to process. There's 226,000 people who are subject to the cap. And if you know, they may have processed some of them in January through March, but assuming three quarters of that has not been processed, um, we'll lose those green cards and the wait time will be, another year of time will be waited and added to their wait time. And some people have already waited seven, 10 years. That means some of the categories have like 20, 30 year wait times. Um, so that's one way that it impacts. And then um, as I mentioned, the order, on Monday expanded upon that first order and um, uh, isn't allowing, again, people outside the country. So if people are outside the country um, applying for H-1Bs, they would be impacted and that includes somebody who maybe had OPT or was on OPT and just went home to visit their family. I mean, maybe with coronavirus, people aren't going home to visit their family as much. So, but, um, but if the person, if people are inside the country on OPT, my understanding is they can still apply for an H-1B, um, but they shouldn't leave the country and they should get proper advice from a lawyer, an immigration lawyer. 
I think the only other thing to add to the executive order from Monday is that mm -hmm. there is a small section in the uh, very end of the executive order that requires the Department of Homeland Security to begin um, uh, looking into preventing work authorization for individuals who uh, have final orders of removal, are inadmissible or deportable, um, or who have been arrested, charged, or uh, convicted of an, an offense in the U.S. Um, it's it's very broad, and the understanding is that it still have to go through the regulatory process, but it is a component of the executive order that specifically affects individuals who are in the U.S. And I'll just add, I mean, I should have framed a little bit, the administration is saying this is all to protect U.S. workers, right? It's this us versus them narrative framework that there's high unemployment, so we can't have immigrants coming in um, to protect the U.S. labor market. But we know, I mean, this has been his agenda since day one to cut immigration, to cut legal immigration. And Congress refused to pass his bill in the Senate that he wanted to get passed to cut family-based immigration. So. That's the, the purported uh, reason is uh, work uh, to, to let U.S. workers have the jobs, and that's why a lot of it's around work authorization. And then um, at the same time, a new rule came out Friday that's going to make it harder for people who are in the process of applying for asylum to get work authorization. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Fahina. Uh, Fahina. Uh, Fahina, I'm sorry, could you speak to how large uh, the Pacific Islander community is in Utah and what do you all view as your biggest legislative priority for 2021? Um, sure. Um, here in Utah, we have approximately 47, between 47,000 to 52,000 um, Pacific Islanders in and as far as, as, far as, as, far as in Utah, uh, here in Utah have been some policies that uh, are people where they were trying to build a truck. Um, it's an environmental kind of issue that. Uh, community in the Rose Park area where they wanted to do a, a main truck run kind of a place where they will have truck huge truck stops right by where a lot of our Pacific Islanders community are going to and that's one of the issues and then of course um, trying to just promote getting our our uh, communities that are um, that can't read in English and stuff, trying to get them involved in the civic issues like voting and things like that. Okay, thank you. I think you went a little bit in and out, but I think we caught the gist of most of what you were saying. So thank you for answering oh, that. Okay. I, did, you, you were able to hear me? I looked like I thought I unmuted my, did I unmute? Oh, no, you did unmute. It just kind of went in and out. I think there were maybe oh. some internet connection issues. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, my, so the United States negotiates particular agreements um, with different Southeast Asian countries. So could you talk a little bit about how, if and how any of these agreements may have changed under the current administration, what kind of impact that's had on the Southeast Asian community? Yeah, um, so there are currently technically two uh, memorandums of understanding between the United States and uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, the first one was with Cambodia in 2002, and that's basically just an agreement that Cambodia will take back, um, you know, basically any individual that the U.S. wants them to take back, um, although they tried to kind of push it every once in a while. And there's been an effort by local organizers in the U.S. and the Cambodian government to uh, try to force the United States to renegotiate that agreement. 
Um, but that's the first one. The second one is the agreement between the U.S. and Vietnam. So in 2008, um, you know, there was an agreement that uh, took place between the two countries. Unlike the Cambodian one, there are specific limitations for who the U.S. can remove through it. So it's been traditionally interpreted as a MOU that protects um, individuals who came to the U.S. Uh, of Vietnamese descent uh, prior to, uh, I think, July 12, 1995, from being deported. And that has technically stayed true um, up until 2018. Uh, when we saw the administration break the particulars of that uh, agreement and then deport about 11 individuals who are pre-95 back to Vietnam. Um, since then, we haven't seen uh, any additional pre-95 Vietnamese individuals uh, get removed, um, but we know that the administration has one, um, you know, unilaterally reinterpreted the meaning of uh, the MOU. Um, so, you know, instead of reading it to say that it prevents the deportation of Vietnamese folks who came to the U.S. prior to July 12, 1995, um, it, they read it as not necessarily preventing them from deportation, um, uh, meaning that they could try to deport them to like other countries or whatnot. Um, and then two, uh, we also know that there's active negotiations between the U.S. and Vietnam um, to try to renegotiate the um, specifics of that. Um, but that's all the information that we sort of have at the moment and sort of how it's changed. So really, TLDR, uh, this administration unilaterally reinterpreted the MOU for Vietnam. All right. Thank you so much. Um, all right, our last question, I know we're going a little over time, so our last question is, uh, what is the role national organizations have been playing in the sanctuary city m movement? Are there cities that are moving towards becoming sanctuary cities, and do national organizations support local groups that are doing this kind of work? And are there any federal fixes or actions that affect how cities exercise their status as sanctuary cities? Right, that was a lot of questions all together. <laughs> so, uh, Megan, would you to start? There are definitely national organizations, Immigrant Legal Resource Center. I can chat that in the box. Um, comes to mind. I think that the um, National Immigrant um, Justice Center also has worked on this issue, and uh, some of uh, our affiliates have worked on it at the state and local level in California and. Um, Chicago. Um, so I'm happy folks want to reach out. But I think to answer about on the federal level, we've mostly been fighting bad congressional actions. Uh, every once in a while, you see an amendment by a Republican um, trying to uh, go after sanctuary cities. And um, so we have to make an effort to defeat them. Um, and also sometimes they're called community trust policies. We've been engaged a little bit in Maryland um, at the state level. They've been trying to get a community trust act passed, um, which is the same thing. Some people just like the terminology trust and some people like sanctuary. Um, so uh, what else? I think the last part, um, so there, I don't think there's anything been positive coming from the federal government, just um, fighting, fighting off negative um, efforts because the Trump administration has tried to say they're gonna go after the cities. I don't think they have been successful um, other than maybe deporting um, higher numbers from those cities, but it's all hard to know what you know the causes are for that. Tom, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, not a ton. I mean, we at CRAC, we uh, really um, uh, look to the leadership and the guidance of our local partners uh, and state partners um, in terms of the, ter um, you know, what they want on immigration reform, specifically around things like sanctuary cities. Um, you know, our role is uh, in, in those efforts is mostly around technical support and technical assistance. Um, but uh, I mean, I think the only thing to add is just that this administration has, you know, threatened all kinds of actions against sanctuary cities uh, from, you know, cutting COVID funding to sanctuary cities or, you know, uh, copy, uh, uh, stopping certain DOJ program, uh, programmatic grant support to sanctuary cities. 
Um, I think, you know, one of the major roles of national organizations is to, one, really just uplift the work of local organizations and help amplify what they're doing in their localities, and two, um, you know, push back defensively against the really awful things that this administration and, you know, the Senate, more often than not, are trying to um, do to go after or, you know, decrease sanctuary cities. And just to be clear, I'm not, I'm nonpartisan. <laughs> I just want to say, I know some Republicans voted for the Illinois Trust Act, right, Becky? Yes, that's uh, right. No, at the, we, at the local it was an level. Illinois yeah, Republican governor who signed it into law. Right, right. So at the local level, we don't see the same dividing lines over these policies, state and local level. All right, great. Thank you for the questions and the, the great answers. So we're going to close. Uh, we, since we have a community organizer on the call, she's going to lead us into a call for action because this policy can only become a reality if we have some community action. So I'll turn it to Sung Wan. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining today. Um, please join us again this Saturday, June 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern time for the AANHPI town hall where we'll also be making our issues heard again. And if you can vote, please go out and vote. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for sharing your expertise and for all of you who joined us this evening. And we really look forward to working with you all too. And we'll see you at the town hall and look forward to working with you all to make this platform a reality. Thanks so much and have a great night. Thanks all. Thank you all.